Okay. Thanks, Matt, for the introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Um, I'll try to talk loudly. Um, so yes, today I'm going to talk to you about my work. Some of it's going to be the stuff that I did as my postdoc, and then some of it's going to be the stuff that we started um, in the McGrath lab um, here at Georgia Tech. Um, so we work on this nematode. Um, it's called C. elegans. Hopefully you guys have all heard about it. It was one of the first uh, completely sequenced metazoans. It has one of the best genomes, um, and it's studied um, to a large part due to its genetic tractability. So in general, we're interested in understanding the genetic basis of trait variation. So you and I and all these people in this room um, have different DNA. Um, about one out of every thousand base pairs is different between us. And so overall, that can lead to differences in um, our behavior, that can lead to differences in our development, how we look, et cetera. And these are important for two different reasons. One, this genetics differences is the substrate for evolution. Um, so, for example, these are um, finches from the Galapagos Island. Um, one of the famous evolutionary changes in a lot of these finches has been the beak size. So, the ability for these uh, finches to speciate into um, birds that have different beak shapes and beak sizes to, to um, use different food sources was dependent on the fact that there was genetic variation that could be selected on. And then disease is a second thing that's very important. Many common diseases have high heritability. Um, so that means the amount of variation in your propensity to get a disease um, often is um, greater than 50% dependent upon um, the genes, uh, your particular set of, of genes. And so uh, there's a very complicated relationship that's hard to predict a priori. So there's a genotype space. Um, this is how one person uh, has selected to uh, display it. Um, uh, that kind of goes over the fact that we have many different genes, many different alleles of different genes, and then these can have very complicated effects on our entire set of phenotypes. And then these phenotypes end up getting selected on in different ways. So exactly how they're selected upon depends upon your environment, and then that leads to some sort of fitness, either a positive fitness that can lead to positive selection and involve new types of traits, or purifying or negative selection, um, such as diseases that could lead to your particular genotype being purified out of the environment. So currently, there's many challenges in understanding how genetic diversity impacts phenotypic variation. We can sequence your DNA very easily. Um, you could do that for about a couple thousand dollars right now, and I can give you a library of all the DNA sequence variances that exist within you compared to the reference uh, genome. But unfortunately, we don't really understand how to predict what effects that has on your phenotype. So if you want to understand how it affects your propensity to get a disease, we can't really do that very accurately. If you want to know what effect this might have on your children, we can't really do that very accurately. And there are a couple main reasons why. Um, so one is that there are many, many different genetic variants that are typically responsible for any phenotypic trait between two in individuals. So if you look at autism, it's not a single gene that's required or that's responsible for someone getting autism or not. There's hundreds of different genes um, uh, that can lead to you having an increased probability um, of, getting, of getting it. Second, there's a large, large, large amount of genetic variation between two individuals. So if I take, um, if I just number how many differences there are between two individuals, it's in the, it's in the order of, of of millions and millions of these. So if you want to actually identify what is the causative genetic variant, you have to be able to filter through these tens of millions of variants to identify what is actually changing. And then finally, epistasis can contribute to phenotypic variation, but it's often very difficult to identify. So epistasis is nonlinear interactions between genes. So the interactions can suppress the effect of one gene versus another, or perhaps can have synergistic effects um, um, between two genes so that your, your phenotypic change is much greater than the individual components. And so this makes it very difficult for statistical based approaches, which typically most people use, to actually identify causative genetic variants. So the approach that we're taking to try to understand this um, in better detail to identify principles that we might be able to better understand what's going on is to take 
um, advantage of long-term evolution experiments. Um, so a famous example of this is Richard Lunsky's work in E. coli. So he's taken 12 populations of E. coli and he's grown them in the lab for over 22 years. And so these E. coli bacteria have spent 50,000 generations adapting to their laboratory culture. New mutations arise and then become fixed within these cultures that have a selective advantage. And he's done a lot of elegant work studying how these E. coli bacteria can evolve um, to the laboratory conditions. It'd be nice to have this in a metazoan so we can understand how things like multicellularity and gene families that are specific to metazoans also impact the ability to evolve or the ability for genetic variants to impact phenotypes. And so in this case, we got lucky that we identified a strain of C. elegans um, and a strain of C. briggsi um, that has grown in the laboratory from between 4 to 52 years. Um, so these, these, these worms have spent um, between 200 and 2,500 generations growing in liquid environment or growing on plates of agar in the, in the laboratory. And as a result of this different growth compared to, the, to, compared to the wild settings versus the laboratory settings, they've evolved to increase their fitness on these, on these um, much different types of environments. And so there's four strains that I'm going to go over today. And these, the lineage of these is designated right here. So C. elegans is a hermaphrodite. So each, uh, it, it doesn't have to have sex in order to reproduce. So it's uh, diploid, but it has both sperm and oocytes in each individual. And so as a result, every animal is completely inbred. And so initially, there is a strain that was isolated in 1951. So this was a single hermaphrodite that was isolated in England. And then it grew for the next six years in the laboratory. At this point, it made its way to a laboratory at, um, in California, um, Ellsworth Doherty's lab, and he split this descendants of this population um, into two different populations, one that he grew in liquid culture and one that he grew on agar plate seeded with bacteria. So these created very different um, selection pressures operating on these two different um, populations. In one case, we think one of the main selection pressures um, was high pheromone level. So animals grown in liquid cultures were grown this way for um, weeks to months at a time. And so these animals were able to, um, to um, release pheromones um, to at naturally high levels that produce selective pressure on the animals. And then in the other case, um, the N2 animals, we think oxygen levels were one of the important selective pressures. So these animals are grown at 21% oxygen, which is very unnatural for them. Um, in the wild, they're, they're found in settings where the oxygen levels is probably more, more close to 10% to 12% oxygen levels. Um, so as a result, we take something that's in initially genetically identical, and then they evolve to um, uh, adapt to their liquid environment, or they've evolved to adapt to the plate environment. And then we have a couple other examples and C. briggsi. C. briggsi is a uh, closely related species uh, to C. elegans. It grew in liquid for a number of years. And then um, CC1 is a strain that grew for about four years in liquid culture as well. So what are the advantages of studying these strains versus studying wild strains of C. elegans? So I could, for example, go to the wild, go to my backyard, um, find rotting fruit, pick it up, and then identify wild C. elegans strains that are growing in Atlanta. And I can study the natural genetic basis of any phenotypic variation between them. So why don't we do that? Well, one, the laboratory adapted strains have only been evolving for many, many less generations. So we think that the genetic basis of traits will be less complex than naturally occurring traits. So these will result in effect sizes that are a little bit larger, and it won't be thousands of variants that are contributing to, to trait variances, but hopefully um, a handful, maybe two to 20 um, variants that will be contributing to these traits. Second, there's a thousand-fold less genetic variance than wild strains of C. elegans. So because they're initially genetically identical, then the only differences are things that have been selected for in the 50 years of growth. And so uh, that means that we can actually identify causative polymorphisms much easier than wild, than wild strains. And then finally, um, because these things also have next, less genetic variance, uh, multiple hypothesis testing is less of an issue in any statistical approaches to identify epistasis between two variants. Okay, so we took this LSJ2 strain 
and we took this N2 strain, and then we completely sequenced them so that we can identify all the genetic variances between them. And it was only on the order of about 300. So instead of wild strains of C. elegans, which have hundreds of thousands of genetic variants, these only have 300. So you can actually go through and you perhaps even memorize every single genetic difference between these two lineages. And then using an outgroup, we can actually classify them either to the N2 lineage, so these are things that could potentially be um, conferring selective advantage to the animals in the high oxygen levels, or the LSJ2 lineage that could be conferring um, selective advantage to animals grown in the liquid high pheromone type um, environments. So I'm going to talk about a couple examples. One that we've learned from studying these strains, one is parallel evolution, um, a particular gene that is repeatedly selected for by growth in liquid culture, and then a cellular mechanism for age-dependent architecture that we've been studying here at Georgia Tech, and then kind of the future directions of our lab um, that we're going with. So the first phenotype I'm going to describe is dower formation. And so dower formation is an alternative develop development state that these worms can enter in order to disperse to new food sources. So typically these are found on rotting fruits. Rotting fruits um, are only going to last for a short period of time in their environment, and then the worms that grow on the bacteria that are on these rotting pieces of fruit are going to have to disperse to find another source of, of bacteria. And so one of the ways they do that is, sorry, they create uh, they enter the stage called dower, and these dower have very classical behaviors called nictation. So nictation is when they go all the way up on their tail, and then they kind of wave back and forth. And so the goal of these dowers is to, to latch on to some sort of arthropod or some other animal that will hopefully carry them to better places. So these dowers are super stress resistant because they're going to be, um, uh, they don't know how long it's going to take before they get to the good food, and they don't know what they're going to encounter on the way. And so this down here is just another example of this dower nictation behavior. They can also form these large clumps of dowers, and then they can crawl up fungi in order to kind of get off the ground as much as possible to latch on to something. So this decision occurs during a particular life stage. So this is um, the, the, the life cycle of C. elegans, so an adult animal lays eggs, these eggs, um, the animals within the eggs grow for about 10 hours until they hatch into a stage called L1, so the first larval stage. Normally, in good conditions, these larvals undergo a, a series of molts, um, which allows us to give a pretty uh, easy name to remember. L2 is after the first molt, L3, L4, and then they become adults. In stressful conditions, they can alter, uh, enter this dower stage. And so this can only occur at a particular time in the animal's life. Um, at L1, they first enter a stage called L2D, and then if things are still bad, they fully commit to the dower, um, the dower life form. This is kind of the most important decision. You know, you think your decisions of like where to go to school are important, but for a dower, this is like for a, for a worm, this is like much more important. So they're either going to think, okay, I need enough food in order to make it for the rest of my life in order to lay eggs or I have to give up on this particular food environment and go into a dispersal stage to find something else. And so, obviously, they put a lot of thought into this decision, um, worm thought, and uh, they measure a lot of different things about their environment. So three really important environmental stimuli that they measure are temperature, food, and pheromones. So if there's a lot of food around, then they kind of predicting, okay, there's probably going to be enough food to get me through until I become an adult. Pheromones, so pheromones are released by other animals, so it's thought to be a quorum sensing me mechanism. So if there's a lot of other animals around, then they're eating the food, and so they're going to cause the food that's around to go away much faster. And so it's kind of like, how, much, how, much, how many animals, how many competitors are around me? If there's too many competitors around me, then I probably want to go into the dispersal stage and find something that's, that's uh, not so overdone. They're kind of worm hipsters, I guess. They don't like things that are, that are too popular. Um, so in the natural environment, they integrate these things, high density, temperature, food. Um, they think food is about to run out, so they go into dower for dispersal. So why would this be something that is selected against in laboratory? 
So in the laboratory environment, they also reach high densities. So the animals grow, they release pheromones, um, they reproduce, and eventually there's a very large amount of worms that are hanging out within these cultures. But this doesn't mean that the food is run, gonna run out. And the alternative, it, instead it actually means that they're probably gonna get more food. Because in the laboratory, when food runs out, then you transfer a subset of the worms to fresh media. And so in this case, high density probably means you know, things are about to get better. And so the animals that go into dower, that go into this dispersal phase, aren't able to reproduce right away. They first have to exit the dower stage, which takes you know, hours, um, while any animals that haven't exited this, 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 that haven't entered this dower stage can immediately start to reproduce and lay eggs. And so this is what we think the competitive advantage would be for animals not to go into dower in response to pheromone. So we measure this. Um, so the N2 animals um, will readily go into dower in response to dower pheromones that have been identified by a number of people. And the components of this dower pheromone have been identified. So four of these um, ascaricides, which are named C3, C5, C6, and C9, this is the chemical structure of these underneath it, um, can also induce dower formation as well. So Rebecca Butcher, our, co our collaborator at Florida, has synthesized these and we can use these in order to actually test instead of by crude um, things that are released, but also to synthesize things um, by themselves. And so again, the LSJ2 animals no longer go in dower in response to any of these pheromones. So this isn't because they can't enter dower, so if you raise the temperature, for example, they still enter the dower stage. So they still have the capacity to go into dower. They just don't do it in response to pheromone. So how do you identify the genetic basis of this defect? So now we turn to a technique, a statistical technique called QTL mapping. And the idea is pretty simple. You just mix up the genotypes of the two starting strains. So you have a mapping population that's some random mixture of 50% strain one, and 50% strain two. And so we start with the LSJ2 strain, the N2 strain, we make them together, we um, clone out a bunch of the animals, we inbreed them so that they have the same genotype on each chromosome, um, and, then we, and then we genotype um, uh, uh, a number of markers to figure out where all the breakpoints are. And so this is our mapping population of about 94 strains, and you can see it's a random mixture of N2 DNA and LSJ2 DNA. So now we phenotype these mapping populations um, in response to dower formation uh, for the synthesized uh, uh, pheromone components. So we can either do it to C3, C5, um, and then C6 and C9 gave very similar results from grouping it together. And then the idea is to correlate the genotype of these animals with the propensity to go into dower to find things that are correlated and associated um, with these phenotypic differences. And so this is what this graph shows you right here. So if the, the, if the score is close to zero, then there's no association between two, uh, the, between a particular genotype marker and the phenotype of the mapping population. If you see a large number above the significance threshold, then that means that there's something there that's associated with the difference. So the way you'd read this graph is there's something on the right arm of the X chromosome that is correlated with the animals willingness to go into dower in response to the C3 pheromone. C5, there's two things that are significant on chromosome two. C6 and C9, there's something on the right arm of chromosome two. So immediately you can see that this difference is pheromone dependent. So there's not like a general defect um, to going into dower, but rather there's, there's um, probably genetic changes that affect sensory processing of these pheromones so that you see different genetic bases in the three different mappings that we did. So we first focused on um, the C3 pheromone, and now we can just take that completely sequenced set of differences between N2 and LSJ2, and we can look within the supported region to find all the different candidates that could be causing this. And there is only one genetic change that had a functional effect on a protein, um, and this was a large deletion of about 4,500 base pairs that deleted two genes called SRG36 and SRG37. So we considered those strong um, candidate genes for this, for this um, difference. And these were chemoreceptor genes um, that are GPCRs and C. elegans. So um, they're part of like olfactory receptors in humans. They're G protein coupled receptors. So the odorant binds, so these things straddle 
the um, intracellular and extracellular. They're, they're kind of the bridge between the exterior and interior of the cell. So they form seven transmembranes that straddle that, and the, the outside and inside environment, and then an odorant can actually bind onto this uh, protein. And when it does, it changes the propensity to um, bind to G protein. So there's alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. And then these can lead to intracellular signaling. So these seem like good candidates to mediate the effect of pheromone, something ex ex extracellular, and uh, the signaling within um, uh, the C. elegans nervous system to sense the C3 pheromone. So we can create a near isogenic line. So this means that we take N2 and replace a small region of it surrounding the significant peak surrounding these two genes. And we see that this no longer goes um, into dour in response to C3. So what this tells you is this small region is sufficient to provide resistance to the C3 pheromone. And then we can rescue that effect by supplying a transgene of both genes or either gene alone. Um, so these seem to be redundant receptors um, that sense the C3 pheromone and then induce the animals to go into dour. We could test this more rigorously by using a technique we call BRICH for receptor-induced calcium transient in a heterologous neuron. And so the idea is to take advantage of the optogenetics techniques that exist. So Corey Bargman's lab was one of the people that really um, pioneered the use of these in C. elegans. And so we can take a neuron. This is a sensory neuron in C. elegans. So C. elegans is very simple. So they all, every single neuron within them has its own name. So one of the named neurons is called ASH. It's a sensory nociceptive neuron. So this is what senses pain in the worm. So if you hit it really hard, then the animal senses it, ASH fires, and the animal backs up and tries to get away. If it's a horrible chemical for it, it senses it, ASH senses it, it backs up and tries to get away. So normally pheromones are in a nociceptive cue, so the animals don't run away when they, you know, they're, they're social animals. So when they sense other worms around them, they don't back up and try to get away. And so if we take ASH, express GCAMP in it, so we can monitor the, the calcium level. So GCAMP is a, uh, a GFP derivative whose fluorescence is based upon intracellular calcium levels. And we pulse the animals with C3. We don't see any response within ASH. So that's this red line right here. Now we take these receptors either SRG36 or SRG37 alone, and we express them ectopically in the ASH neuron. So if these are actual receptors, we're hoping that they're going to be expressed in the cilia of ASH. We're hoping that they couple to the G proteins within ASH. And if it does, and if everything works out, then we should now see calcium responses. And so that's what we see. Now when we pulse the animals with C3, we see nice robust responses in ASH. So this is true for SRG36 and SRG37. So from this, we conclude that these are chemoreceptors. They're redundant. They send, they're redundant in these crude dour assays that we're doing. Um, and they've been deleted in LSJ2. So this is why we think that the C3 component has been um, uh, affected in the LSJ2 liposome animals. So we can also take these other strains that have grown in liquid environments and see what happens to them. So one thing we can do is just test, do these things go into dour? So CC1 is a strain that's grown for four years in liquid culture. So this is grown at NASA. Um, so they wanted to take C. elegans up into space with them. So they didn't want to have, um, so normally you have them on like agar plates and you have to pick them. So I guess they didn't want the astronauts to have to learn to like pick in, in zero gravity. So instead, they grew them in liquid culture. And over the course of the experiments of trying to figure out how to grow it best, it spent about four years in these liquid environments before it was frozen down. So this animal, again, doesn't go into dour um, in response to pheromone. And now we can sequence this SRG36 and 37 region. And again, we find a deletion that gets rid of both genes. And then we can rescue it with a transgene of SRG36 and SRG37. So this is an example of parallel evolution. So these strains started in pretty much the same initial, initial genetic space. They undergo um, the same um, change, growth in liquid um, cultures for a long period of time. 
and then they evolve uh, very similar genetic effects, which is the deletion of these two genes. And then this is even true um, within the second species, C. brixii. So this is the SRG family. This is the phylogeny of it, taken from three um, C. elegans, uh, three C. norebditis species: C. elegans, C. brixii, and C. romanii. And so we can look how these um, receptors are evolving within these three species. So this is SRG 36 and 37. These are the things that are repeatedly deleted in C. elegans. And we can look, is there an ortholog um, in C. briggsy? So there's not. So if there was an ortholog, the phylogeny would look something like this, where you have a green, blue, and red um, uh, thing all next to each other. So we couldn't directly test for an ortholog, so instead we, we tried to test for um, a closely related paralog. So we sequenced these two genes in C. Briggsy, CBG23681 and CBG24690, and in one of these we found another deletion. So this deletion was much larger, it was about 35 kb, but it basically deleted the entire gene along with the number ones around it. Very similar experiments could be done to test, is this what's um, uh, required, is this involved in, in um, the difference in, in, in Dower formation in C. Briggsy. We can start with a, the wild strain. We can start with um, the laboratory selected strain. It no longer forms Dower in response to pheromone. We can create a near isogenic line surrounding CB2490 and show it, show it has a significant effect on Dower formation, which we can then rescue with transgenic expression of just the CBG24690 gene. We can also perform these rich experiments to show that it senses C3. And kind of interestingly, it now shows. Um, responses to a different pheromone known as C6. So, so this phylogenetic difference um, seems to suggest that there are actual functional differences that are evolving within these chemoreceptors. So even though they're C3 receptors, even though they're involved in Dower formation, there perhaps are other subtle differences that could be having um, ecological effects in Dower and in, in propensity to form Dower um, uh, in, in natural environments. Okay, so this is very surprising. Why would you see a chemoreceptor repeatedly selected for over and over and over again? So kind of the framework that we think about these things is you have your starting um, genotype, you know, you can have some sort of sequence, and then um, typically when you do classical genetics, you use EMS to change this genotype. So you see G to A transitions, um, or you can have natural mutations that could do other things as well. Um, delete a particular nucleotide, large deletions, etc. So this genotype has an effect on the phenotype. So you can also write the phenotype vector out. So let's say you're omnis omnificent, omnificent uh, uh, and you knew all the different phenotypes of C. elegans, and so you could list these out as a vector. So the propensity to form dowers in response to a certain pheromone, the egg laying rate, the growth rate, etc. And so the different changes in the genotype will have different effects. So some will affect lots of phenotypes, some are pleiotropic, some don't affect a lot of, a lot of phenotypes. And so you can't just answer in order to figure out what can be selected for by growing in these new laboratory conditions, you can't just answer what has an effect on dower formation, you have to know the entire phenotype vector. And that's because fitness is, is a function of all the entire phenotype vector. And so you might have a change that changes dower propensity, but you also have a, a the genetic change has a pleiotrop, pleiotropic effect on growth rate. And so when you sum up all these effects to figure out whether or not the, what the selection is, you might have a negative effect on selection. And so what our results suggest to us is there's not a lot of ways to change dower formation in response to C3 without changing a lot of other things that have a negative effect on fitness. And so what these chemoreceptors provide is a genetic substrate to non-pleiotropically affect phenotype. Um, so uh, you can modify this, you can delete these receptors, and all you seem to be changing is C3-induced dower formation. You don't seem to be changing growth rate, you don't seem to be changing egg laying rate, etc., and all these other traits that are related to fitness. 
So is this something that's only important for C. elegans? You know, C. elegans can't see. They're, they obviously care a lot about their chemical environment, so maybe this is something that's specific to just C. elegans. But we think um, this could even have roles in human evolution. So it seems kind of odd. We don't usually think about our smell being something that's very important. Um, but one of the things that people find when they do a lot of genomic approaches um, to study things that are under selection is that olfactory and taste perception is often under positive selection. So this is a paper from Joe LaChance, um, who's uh, a professor now at Georgia Tech, and um, they searched um, for regions of the genome that are under selection and then looked for commonalities between these genes. And what they found was olfactory and taste perception were one of the classes that were overrepresented. And people find this when they search, for example, um, in, in the evolution of, of, um, of uh, mammals and vertebrates as well. So it seems like even in humans, olfactory selection is an important um, is important for our, for uh, whether or not we survive. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to switch gears and now talk about some of the recent work we've been doing studying egg laying rate in C. elegans. So egg laying rate is also something that's probably very important for the animals, um, as it, de it, it determines how how many offspring it has in a period of time. And so in C. elegans, it's a hermaphrodite, as I told you. This is a picture of the germline assembly line that basically mass produces eggs. So they can, they can create about 300 eggs over the course of their lifetime before they die. And so initially they produce sperm cells, um, and then these sperm cells are, are stored in an organ called the spermatheca. So there's actually 300, around 300 of these sperms that are sitting in the spermatheca. And then starting from a distal tip cell, this creates the germline stem, stem cell niche. Um, um, uh, germline stem cells originally undergo um, mitosis, and then the further they get away from the distal tip cell, um, they transition into meiosis, and then this whole, the, these cells are continuing to move through this gonad, um, going through meiosis, um, and then going through oogenesis to becoming bigger, um, until um, they're ready to ovulate, enter the spermatheca, and then emerge as a fertilized egg. And so we're studying egg laying rate, and we think what we're studying by studying the egg laying rate is kind of the speed of this germline assembly line. So um, one, we again see differences between the N2 and LSJ2 strain, and we think these differences might be influenced by pheromones. So we decided to test not only a, a single period of time, but rather the egg laying rate over the entire age of the animals. So starting from sexual maturity, day one, day two, day three, day four, and then day five, when the N2 animals normally no longer lay eggs. And so you can see, based upon the blue line, that the N2 animals that have grown on plates for about 15 years lay eggs at a much higher rate um, than the LSJ2 um, animals. This switches over the course of their life. So by day four, LSJ2 animals lay more eggs than N2. And this continues for the final day of the assay on day five. The F22 is a gene that's required for producing um, the pheromones. So if animals are mutated in this enzyme, they no longer produce pheromones and they no longer release pheromones. So these animals have a much lower rate of egg laying over the course of the five days. So this suggests that pheromones might actually stimulate um, egg laying rate. So this might make sense if the animals are surrounded by a bunch of other animals and they think pump out eggs as fast as you can. If they're not, then they can take their time and perhaps put more quality into the egg production, et cetera. Um, so again, we map the difference in this genetic difference between N2 and LSJ2 egg laying rate. So for each of the 94 rills, we pick six L4s and then transfer them to plate to plate to map the difference on all five of these different days. Now this is the results. This actually summarizes a lot of work. Um, so up top is the phenotype of um, the 94 rills on the five different days. So day one, two, three, four, and five. So initially, these, the, this time point kind of also details sexual maturity, captures sexual maturity, the rate of sexual maturity. So originally, they have a very low egg laying rate, around one per hour, or around half per hour. 
and then this increases, and then eventually you see a bimodal distribution by day five. So again, we can do QTL mapping, and um, in, each, in four of the five time points, we find something um, on the right side of chromosome two um, that seems to be really important. But not on day four, but then we see it again on day five. So now we can take these 94 rills, we can look at their genotype at that particular locus, and we can segregate them based upon that. So if the animals have the N2 allele at this locus, we plot them here. If the rills have the LSJ2 allele at this locus, we plot them here. So these have mixtures of DNA at all the other places except for this chromosome 2 region right here. And then these have different mixtures except for this region right here. And so this you can use to infer the linear effect of this particular locus. So at this time point, the LSJ2 allele suppresses egg laying. On day two, the LSJ2 allele suppresses egg laying, suppresses egg laying, and then it seems to have no effect. So this is why we don't pick it up in the QTL mapping, and then it switches direction. So we see an age-dependent effect of this particular allele, where it initially decreases, the LSJ2 allele initially decreases the egg laying rate, and then later on increases the egg laying rate. Um, so this is a very strong effect QTL, and so this can mask the effect of anything that's also contributing on a more minor basis. And so the way you statistically control for that is um, using this locus as a conditional, and so when we do that we can pull out other things that are also affecting egg laying rate. And so we find a number of different things, in total about um, six total QTLs seem to be affecting egg laying rate. So what's the big thing on the chromosome 2? So this is a 60 base pair deletion. So again, we see a deletion that seems to be being selected for in this gene called NERF1. NERF1 is um, homologous to NERF301 in Drosophila and BPTF in humans. So this is part of the NERF complex. This is a chromatin rearranger. Um, so it uh, expresses, and so it um, is recruited to particular regions and then it can use the ICY um, ATPase in order to remodel chromatin to presumably change the propensity of gene expression around that locus. And so there's a 60 base pair deletion that specifically affects a subset of the isoforms of NERF1. So this is kind of a, a model of what people think it's doing. So in eukaryotes, there's histones, and these histones um, can have particular marks um, on their tails. So one important mark is H3K4 trimethylation, and then another one is H4K16 acetylation. And so this NERF1 or BPTF has domains that recognize those particular marks. So we think that uh, basically histones that have both of these marks are recognized by the, by the, um, uh, the NERF complex due to BPTF or NERF1, and then this brings in um, ICY, I switch that can then remodel the chromatin around it to, for example, allow transcription to occur around this region. And then we have another, a number of candidates, again, because there's so few mutations within LSJ2 and N2, we have another of good candidates that we're now actually testing within the lab um, to see if those are actually the causative genes. So these include acetyltransferases, MAP kinase-dependent kinases, Raptor, um, rapamycin, which is uh, targeted by rapamycin, um, another chemoreceptor, and then a MAP kinase kinase. So now we can take it a step further, and instead of just looking at the effect of the NERF1, the thing on the right of chromosome 2, we can look at two loci at the same time. And so now instead of just dividing these rills, these 94 rills by one genotype, we're dividing them by two. So the NERF1, the N2 allele of NERF1, and the N2 allele of the QTL on 5. So these are the strains that have both of those genotypes. N2, LSJ2, LSJ2, N2, and LSJ, LSJ2. So the four possible combinations. And so then we can plot the effect of the modifier QTLs in the two backgrounds of NERF1. So in this way, we can also see if there's epistatic or nonlinear interactions between um, these, two, these two genotypes. And so if it has an effect, then we accept to see a line um, with a slope. Um, if it doesn't have an effect, like on day five, 
then you don't see a line when you plot the difference in the averages. So initially this has an additive effect, and that's because the lines point in the same direction. Additive effect, additive effect, and then on day four we see an epistatic effect um, where the lines now point in different directions. And so what this means is the effect of the modifier QTL depends on which NERF1 background that it's actually in. So this is kind of curious. We see this age dependence, for example, in NERF1 activity, and then we see this um, age dependence of epistatic interactions with NERF1. And we see this for a lot of uh, the different modifier QTLs. So here we plotted all five of the modifier QTLs, and then in yellow we plotted when they have an epistatic interaction with yellow one, so this is significant by ANOVA, and then red are significant, which is an additive effect between them. But you can see a lot of these things have an epistatic interaction later on in life. So four of these uh, modifiers have an epistatic interaction at day four or day five. So why might this be? Um, the genetic variant is constant through life. It's not like the genetic variation is changing. In a lot of cases, the effect on protein function seems constant through life. So you lose um, some domains of NERF1. Um, some of the candidate genes are loss of functions, um, so it's not obvious why all these different um, uh, genetic interactions would have this age dependence. So one hypothesis that we had is that limitation of sperm can play a role. So um, each hermaphrodite is born with a limited number of sperm. So the way the germline is set up is initially you make sperm and then you switch into making oocytes. So you can't change your mind later and make more sperm if you run out. So the animal is born with a fixed number of sperm that it can use or not use during the course of its life. This sperm number can have feedback on the rate of ovulation. So the number of these sperm are, sport, are stored in the spermatheca, and they release this hormone called major sperm protein. So this major sperm protein can go into the gonad arm where the oocytes are, and then they're actually sensed by receptors on the oocyte, and they're sensed by receptors on the sheath um, surrounding the, the oocytes. And this actually induces ovulation. So the rate of ovulation then is increased um, by the animals, and so the, the egg enters the spermatheca uh, more often. So if there's a lot of sperm, it induces ovulation. You have oocytes entering it much more rapidly. If there's lot, not a lot of sperm, then you don't have a lot of MSP, and that decreases the rate of ovulation. So there's this feedback between total sperm number and ovulation rate of the animal. And then as the animal is aging, um, you're decreasing the number of sperm, decreasing the number of MSP, and decreasing the rate of ovulation. So what these genetic factors are doing is they're changing the rate at which you use up this sperm. So something like NERF1, which has a large effect, initially has a much higher rate of egg laying, which means you're using up sperm more often. So by day four, they have a different amount of sperm than the NERF1 LSJ2 animals that have had a slower rate of egg laying early on. So kind of a, a toy model to think about this um, is in the context of a golf cart. So a golf cart run on batteries. So it starts out with full charge. And very commonly, you can add a governor to these golf carts to prevent how fast you can go. So you might have a governor that's set at 24 miles an hour, and you might have a governor set at 12 miles, miles an hour. And so initially, when the, the golf carts are first running, this Model A is much faster than the Model B. But if you keep running this over and over and over again, you're going to be using up the battery much more rapidly. So uh, by day four, this battery is nearly empty, and so the rate at which this, this golf cart is going is much slower than the Model B, which hasn't used up as much of the battery. And so in the case of sperm, the battery source is the sperm, the total number of sperm, and initially it's the same, we think, or close to the same in the N2 and LSJ2 animals, and then the governor is sent by the various QTLs um, within them. So you can decrease or increase the rate of egg laying, and then initially that has one effect, so on day one, and two has a combination of QTLs that leads to a rate of about 3.8 eggs per hour per worm, and the LSJ2 animals have about 2.6 eggs per hour per worm. But then, the, then by day four, the N2 animals are running out of sperm, they're running out of MSB, and so that decreases the rate of ovulation, while the LSJ2 animal still has 25 to 75 sperm 
And so their rate of ovulation is much higher because of that. So even though their governor is set lower, this limitation in sperm number can result in age dependence and then epistasis between the different variants. And so as a way to test that, um, we can um, take advantage of the fact that C. elegans is a male hermaphrodite species, so they also can produce males. These males can mate with hermaphrodite, for hermaphrodites, and then they um, transfer a number of sperm within them. So we can artificially increase the number of sperm that these animals have, and then measure their egg laying rate um, after we do that. So this is um, uh, egg laying rate on day four. So the animals that have the N2 allele of NERF1 um, lay about the same amount as the LSJ2 allele of NERF1, but if we've mated them, then they go back up to this normal big difference. So again, the N2 allele of NERF1 lays eggs at a much higher rate. So we think this is um, proof, or not proof, but this is at least consistent with our model. Okay, so I kind of described stuff I did in my postdoc, stuff we're doing right now in the laboratory, and we're continuing to kind of analyze the LSG2 and N2 trait differences. So we're trying to identify all the causative mutations that have an effect on egg laying, and then study these in more detail to study, um, for example, epistasis that occurs early on in life, um, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that this work suggests is that perhaps we can use this directed evolution as an overall strategy to study um, a trait. And so um, our goal is to evolve multigenic changes to any trait of interest. So you know, one of the things that we found is that we're finding different genes than you normally would by classic forage genetics. So dower formation has been studied to death in the C. elegans field, but all the things that we find in LSJ2 aren't predicted to have an effect on dower formation. So we're finding new genes that are involved in dower formation. And this is also true with the egg laying stuff that we're finding. We're finding things that have a more subtle effect um, on, on these different traits, but um, wouldn't have been pulled out by normal, normal ways. The idea is that if you can provide artificial selection on whatever trait you're interested in, then you can slowly evolve it, you know, starting from one, fix a mutation on this chromosome that decreases it a little bit, and then over and over again until you have a very strong change that you would see in, for example, a classic forage genetics way. So one of the ways we're doing this as a proof of principle, we're trying to re-evolve re resistance to dower-inducing pheromones. So if we, for example, mutagenize animals, and then grow them in um, different amounts of pheromone, we think we can select for animals to uh, no longer go into dower in response to the pheromone. So, you know, we can use different strengths. So, like the different amounts of pheromones will lead to different number of animals normally going into to dower. So, red is animals that have gone into dower, and then the black animals haven't, and these are the ones that can reproduce in the next generation. And so, we just do this for multiple generations. And then eventually we'll select, we think we'll select for animals that no longer go into dower in response to pheromone. And then we're also collaborating with the Lou Lab. Um, and so as a secondary proof of principle, we're actually trying to be able to evolve changes to any sort of fluorescent marker. So in this day and age of GFP, you know, you can use GFP as a measure of all sorts of different things. You can use it as a measure of um, fat content which in, within the animal. You can use it as a marker of aging. You can use it as a marker of synapses, etc. And so there are high throughput approaches that the Lou Lab have, have developed using microfluidics to automatically feed worms through a microfluidics chip to an imaging field, cool them down so you can do very careful imaging, and then you take a picture and you can measure the fluorescent levels, for example, of different markers. And so we can potentially use this as a source of selective pressure. So we can sort the worms into different populations, the garbage, the trash population that dies, and then the population that can actually um, um, seed the next generation. And so the idea is to sort tens of thousands of worms through the sorter to select for animals that have different phenotypes, and then do this over and over and over again until we can select for subtle changes to the fluorescent marker. Um, so then the idea is that we start with two phenotypes that would normally overlap with each other, we set a sorting gate around that, and then by progressively doing this, we fix these mutations that fall within this, and then we can iterate this process to fix multiple mutations to create strong effects to fluorescent phenotypes. Um, so that's it. Um, thanks to 
all the members of the lab. A lot of the, the data that I showed you was produced by Ed Large, a postdoc in the lab. And then uh, some of this was done with, uh, uh, this work was done when I was a postdoc in the Bartman lab. And funding sources, and thanks for your attention.